We're going to hope that we can recreate that community virtually tonight. And here we are. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator, writer and essayist, novelist extraordinaire, Panache Chigumadzi, who's going to be our guide this evening. We don't want to take too long to see them in chat. Please live through. We meet and share on social media tags our Instagram hashtag blacklit. Please be sure to tag our speakers at our Nathan underscore John, at Tando underscore MGQO, at PJ Mendes, and at Panache Chig. The handles are in the chat box. If you're in the UK, you can buy copies of our Nathan, Paul, and Panache's books at Black Female Owned Bookshop, This Is Book Love, www.thisisbooklove.com. And you can buy Tando's ebook, A Man Who's Not a Man, from the Cassava Republic website. And now it is over to you, Panache. Hello, thank you so much, Lynette. And hello to everybody. If you can just do a little handshake so we can all see each other and we know that we're alive. <laughs> I'm really excited to be joining you. I mean, it's the evening now, and for me, it's the afternoon, it's 2 p.m. I'm in Boston. Um, but I'm really excited to have this session today with Black Literary Salon. The first one is absolutely amazing and it was live, so we couldn't be part of it. Well, this one, the beauty of the digital world is that we get to be together and we get to commune together in very difficult times. So the first thing I'd like to do, we'd all just heard the, the bios are there on the side of the, of the authors, but I'd like to just welcome our authors, three extraordinary um, black men writers from across the Atlantic. And I'd just like them to say hello very quickly and tell us where are you um, and respond to that with as much writing license as possible. Um, you know, where are you spiritually? Where, the, where are you emotionally? Where are you physically? I'd like to know um, just what it means to be where you are in this moment in history. We start with Tando, since I can see his face. Oh, really? But it's not nepotism, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> and excuse me, I promise this is also just, I'm also get, getting used to Zoom. So we're all gonna bear with each other with, with this format. So I'll start with Tando simply because I can see him right now, but I'll get to see everyone else as well. Well, thank you, Panache, and hello, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I'm really delighted and honored to be part of uh, the second edition of, um, of the Salon. Um, to quickly get to Panache's question, where am I? Well, physically, I am in Cape Town, South Africa, um, also known as Wuhan, because it is the epicenter of the coronavirus in these parts. Um, I, you know, been thinking about where I am, you know, spiritually, emotionally, you know, we kind of touch on this casually uh, before we started. What I'm really preoccupied with at the moment is, is my role as a father, because I spend basically the whole day, I've spent the whole day for the last four months with my daughter, which is something that hadn't happened since she was an infant. Uh, but now so she's, she's out of school, I get to be with her, you know, from 8 a.m. until the p.m. So I'm thinking about that, but I'm also thinking consciously about, you know, being a father to a black girl in this so violent world um, and the limits that, um, that are there for me in terms of how I can protect her um, so I'm constantly thinking about that, about being a father. In fact, the, the, the correct description for this is, I wake up every day to the terrifying idea that I'm a father to a black girl into this very violent world. And that's really um, where I am at the moment. And maybe I should just add that we're all trying to survive. There's a global pandemic um, that is upon us. There is a lot of activism in this time. You know, we're talking about Black Lives Matter, but also locally that I find myself kind of constrained to participate in, you know, because we've done a lot of this in the last four or five years. And, you know, for me, it's been time to kind of check myself and be in the background rather than being the loud voice um, around, you know, issues that are, that are calling on our activism at this time. 
Thank you for sharing, Tando. Um, can we have Paul speak next? Hi, um, my name is Paul Mendes. I'm the author of Rainbow Milk, um, which was published by Dialogue Books here in London um, during the lockdown um, in April. And um, I really wanted to stick to an April publication date because it's what my publisher had been working towards for a long time. Um, but then obviously the lockdown happened. Um, but you know, I'm extremely lucky to be working with um, Charmaine Lovegrove and um, others who are just incredibly innovative and um, just really sort of gave my book uh, an amazing sort of start to life. So I must have been one of the first people to have a book launch on Instagram Live. Um, and especially during the um, pandemic. Um, and it's been, I'm just really, really happy with the reception that it's got so far and the, the readership that I've, um, that I've started to, um, to, to uh, connect with. Um, so yeah, as I said, I'm in London, um, where it's extremely hot today. I think it's the hottest day of the year so far. Uh, I've not left the house at all because I've been reading and um, just being really busy with various different things. Um, and I guess that's kind of where I am at the moment generally, just post-publication, just having a lot to do. Uh, a lot of wonderful things are happening. Um, and so I feel, um, yeah, in spite of what's going on around the world, all the things that Tando has mentioned, um, I feel extremely pr privileged and um, sort of newly in a position and uh, newly on a platform where I can sort of amplify my, my voice a little bit more, especially from um, a Black British queer perspective. Thank you for sharing, Paul. Here we have uh, our Nathan sharing with us. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm in Berlin. Um, I'm still underemployed, um, as most writers are. Spiritually, I still still have. Um, <laughs> And unlike Dando, I haven't gotten anyone pregnant. So, <laughs> but you know, work-wise, uh, I'm I'm trying to interrogate uh, complicated histories and the complications in history, especially uh, with relation to power and relativity, especially uh, particularly as it exists in places like uh, northern Nigeria. I'm also trying to research the psychological effects of religion in. Nigerian communities beyond the commonly seen and, and discussed effects, uh, but, but especially on a, on a personal level. Um, I'm hoping that uh, I can guilt Bibi into publishing the next novel, which she still doesn't seem to like very much. It sounds like some blackmail, but we'll just put that yeah. to the side. <laughs> <laughs> We'll put that to the side, you can get safe with us. But thank you so much for sharing. And I think that's really just the spirit with which we'd like to continue tonight, that um, it really is a space where we're thinking with, communing with each other. We're not so much just um, listening um, to a one-way dialogue or three different authors speaking with, with, with a moderator. It's going to be dialogue with, with all of us. And please feel free to put in some of your thoughts in the chat session as we go along. Uh, but I think it's really important just as our Nathan mentioned, as someone who's interested in history, um, that we do gather at a very particular point in, in history, um, a point in history that's marked by, you know, the words, I can't breathe. And that's not just by the many hashtagged and unhashtagged black men and women who've been lynched um, by various um, processes over the last 500 years, really but particularly also just thinking about how COVID-19 has also made visible some of the fault lines within our world and particularly around black life. And again, this question of, I can't breathe. So coming together tonight um, is one of my first times I'm doing a sort of a Zoom, uh, a, a Zoom panel. And it reminds me of, of, of the first one I actually um, listened to a few weeks ago, a few months ago um, with the poet uh, Benga Adishina. And he mentioned, you know, to come together is to breathe together. So in light of the boot that's on our neck and particularly the boot that's on black men's neck tonight is a practice of coming together together to bring together to think with and reflect with um, each other on this space and particularly it is about taking a deep breath to 
think through all the complex emotions and ways of being, joy, fear, anger, tenderness, care, aggression, softness, trauma, pain, all of the things that are usually flattened out by that boot that is on our neck, the ways in which all the different kinds of imaginations and possibilities of ways of being are often stamped out by this boot. And by the boot, we mean slavery, colonialism, um, genocide, land theft, mass migration, all of those different processes that have complicated and over-determined the ways in which we think about Black masculinity. And so tonight, it is that space to open up that imagination away from the gaze. Um, literature, as you know, with Ubuntu, we speak about imagining ourselves into existence. It is about prying open away from the gaze, a dehumanizing gaze, a pathologizing gaze, to speak very honestly amongst ourselves. It is not a platform for uh, the vague platitudes around as men we need to do better. Um, that has not saved black women. Um, as a black woman in particular, we also speak at a point where there is a simultaneous sense of great possibility as well as a sense of disappointment. Um, when we hear of women like Tehova Tokule, for example, of Toyin Sarau, who you know, were murdered at the hands of our brothers, and we have to talk about that kind of thing as we're going to speak about Black men and imagine new ways of being. Um, and is prying open both the present, the past, and the future to do this kind of space. So I'm very excited to have our um, three participants start off by reading an excerpt from some of their works. And I think these are really great at capturing some of the things that we're interested in, is really querying quite critically what it is that we mean by Black masculinities. And that's the key word tonight, it's Black masculinities and selfhoods, because we're saying that and we're interested in moving away from a monolithic and flattening idea of what Black masculinities are. So we'll start, I think this time we can start with Al Nathan, uh, since he was last, last time with his, <laughs> with his um, excerpt from his essay in the anthology that was published by Cassava Republic, which is called Safe House. Um, I will be reading from an essay called The Keepers of Secrets. Um, feminine men. Although Tucker's small room is full of clutter, pots, Pans, plates, bowls, clothes, bags, 10 of us find a way to fit in. Before long, the restless young men give up trying to look dignified and well-behaved in the presence of their ua, mother, as Michael playfully calls Tukur. Giggling, play fighting, and innuendos and two between four of the young men sitting on one of Tukur's thin mattresses. I begin speaking to Mahmoud, a young, handsome 25-year-old whose texturized hair glistens even in the dimly lit room, a permanent grin on his face as he shares his stories with risque humor. He sells food, as do many of the endo do in the room, an occupation, at least in many parts of Muslim northern Nigeria, considered women's work. There are various translations of the term endo do, singular, the plural being endo do, from the simplistic male homosexual to transgendering men. The history of the term has been connected to the practice of Bori, a religion of possession by a pantheon of spirits. From Besma in the book Horses, Musicians and Gods writes that Dodu is a praise name for the Bori spirit Dangala Dima. And Dodu such as Tukur and his children belong to a close-knit social vocational network of men who are effeminate in manner and appearance and who engage in trades such as cooking and selling food in the market, traditionally associated with women. Most, in addition to their given male names, have female names used by fellow Ndodu. As I travel between Kano and the FCT, where I'm connecting with and speaking to men like Tukur, I have in my bag the book, Allah Made Us, Sexual Outlaws in an Islamic African City by academic Rudolf Pell Gaudio. This is an entire subculture complete with codes, speech, patterns, songs and dances, and sometimes religious practices as conducted in the Hausa religious order of spirit possession. Bori, what Tukur calls Hawang Iska, the mountain of spirits. 
Um, I'm going to stop there just because I, I just realized the excerpt is, is much longer than all the others. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, what I would just like to, to share with us is why you decided to choose that particular except what is it doing or was it what is it telling us what does it reveal to us in this particular moment or in generally i remember in 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 talking about uh, masculinities uh, for a course i was i was uh, it's, uh, teaching here in berlin someone who was in the department asked you know who i end up do how can you how can you describe them in english and this became the basis for how we led that seminar because a lot of people find it very difficult to describe these group of men who identify as men, but who perform several um, um, sort of gendered roles in society and, and the complexity of their lives, especially within the cultural context that is Northern Nigeria, as most of them Hausa speaking men with no vocabulary that exactly matches the, the very commonly um, spoken of identities that we find, especially in, in sexual identities. Um, so I, I, I thought um, to look at this part and, and add dimension to this, you know, conversation around masculinity and the different types of masculinities and hope, hoping that we would start a conversation around these multiple layers in which the men exist and that um, it's, perhaps it might benefit us to talk about the relationship between these masculinities and how in fact the same kind of um, hurt that is replicated outside masculinity exists within masculinity um, where you talk about whether it's subordinate masculinities or hegemonic masculinities especially among um, um, black men in in, in the place which I chose to write about Northern Nigeria. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed that, that um, excerpt and we're gonna get back into it a little later into the conversation. But the key aspect that I think is highlighted in the different excerpts is the ways in which masculinities are defined differently in different contexts. And for that I'd ask um, Paul to then share his, uh, because I think it's quite illuminating around um, how masculinities can be defined from the external um, vantage point. Um, so a little bit of background. So um, Jesse McCarthy, this is Christmas Day 2001. Um, Jesse McCarthy is uh, a 19 year old um, black uh, Jehovah's Witness from uh, the black country in the West Midlands. And he has been actually disfellowshipped from the organization. So he um, is no longer allowed to communicate with in any way anyone that he grew up with, the people he calls auntie and uncle, even if they're not blood relatives. Um, so he's in exile in the family home and it's Christmas Day, Jehovah's Witnesses don't celebrate Christmas. Um, and he, he, he's black, his mother is black. His mother married a white Jehovah's Witness when Jesse was two years old. And Jesse has um, a slightly dysfunctional relationship with this white stepfather. Christmas, he stayed in his room with crisps and snacks, craving a spliff, even a cigarette. His parents and the children watched TV downstairs all day. He was not invited to eat with them. He'd bought Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin, finally, which his GCSE English teacher had encouraged him to read. It dawned on him that the novel depicted a gay relationship. He panicked to think she might have recommended it to him because he was a black gay like Baldwin. Still, he managed it in one day from cover to cover. He thought it striking that a black man could, in the first paragraph, have his main character look himself in the mirror and see a tall, blonde, white man standing there in his dressing gown holding a tumbler of whiskey, and it brought a tear to his eye because he recognized that if he was a tall, blonde, white boy, everything would have been different. He recognized that he had thought of himself as a blonde, white boy all his life. He'd never thought of himself as a black boy or compared himself to other black people. 
he'd known so few black people. And those his mother knew, she often derided for being too black, doing things in too black a way, being late because they were too black, being disorganized because they were too black, being rough and uneducated because they were too black. He wouldn't have been treated so harshly if he wasn't too black. He would be cooped up in a prison cell, an exile within the family home, too embarrassed to accept any of his workmates' invitations to spend Christmas with them and their families if he wasn't too black. He knew he would have to spend the rest of his life convincing people that he wasn't too black. He managed to keep himself together until Easter, when the witnesses, separately from the main branches of Christendom, mark the Passover, which Jesse refused to attend. He came home from work that night, stoned, just as Graham was closing the house to go to bed. They looked at each other. Jesse, unexpectedly to himself, started to cry. Sorry, he said. I'm sorry. He kept saying, I'm sorry. He moved towards Graham and put his head on his shoulder. Graham remained unmoved, hands by his sides. All Jesse wanted was some love. He hugged him, squeezed him, grabbed handfuls of his flesh, smelled his neck, kissed him, leaked tears into him. Graham firmly grabbed Jesse by both arms and held him away from himself. Through his teeth, he said, you've got to get out of this house. Thank you. Tando, would you share your um, excerpt? And again, what's interesting is a bridge between the two of you. Both of you are interested in coming of age narratives. Um, yeah. And there's something about the body and the current coming of age narratives. I won't spoil this too much, but would you share? And then we can have a, uh, we can really pry this conversation open around masculinities. Sure, thank you very much. Um, so my excerpt is probably going to be the shortest. Um, and I'm reading from a man who is not a man. Maybe a little background to that is that um, Kasava Republic is putting out this book. We were supposed to have massive launches in London, Lagos, and New York. <laughs> hey, there you are, El Nathan. <laughs> um, but COVID-19 happened. And I've chose, you know, the opening section of the book. Um, and the reason for that is when I was writing the book, I started with chapter one. And when I finished that, I thought, the story hasn't begun, I have to go back. You know, so whenever I'm reading um, to an audience like this one, I like to just um, select that opening section. But the other reason is also that this is a section, as you will find out shortly, that uh, for me speaks to the epicenter of male sexuality and masculinity, which is the penis, except that the penis in this instance is wounded. So here we go. This story is about how I came to have an abnormal penis. So there you have it. My genitalia is not the normal type. By that I mean it hasn't got the distinctive lollipop shape with a nobly shape that most men boast of. Let me say that that's not because I was born this way. When I was a boy, the potential and everything was there, you know? There are no funny stories related about me at birth. Some boys get told that their wheelies were so small, their mothers gave them girls' names. Me, I was a real boy from the wet go, with both my balls fully descended and the promising look that I would one day own a formidable loin. But Satan had other plans. Have you ever wondered what happens to Abba Kweta, whose circumcision fails at the bush? You have seen their sorrowful white smeared faces and bulgy bloodshot eyes. You have seen their ugly shaven heads weighed down with shame and disappointment. I'm talking about the young Kosa boys whose misfortune affords them the costly opportunity to grab headlines in every available news source. If you belong to the 0.001% of South Africans who have not heard about or seen these boys, I suggest you consult your nearest media house. 
The Eastern Cape's Daily Dispatch must hold the record for such stories on its archive front pages. Call up the newspaper first thing tomorrow and write your thesis on it. You may want to formulate your hypothesis according to the following questions. Who exactly are these miscreants whose circumcisions failed? What type of people were they before they were circumcised? What happens to them at the mountain? And who do they become afterwards? That's an important one. Who do they become? Well, you might not need to call up the newspaper anymore because here I am. I'm one of those survivors. And this is what I've become, a survivor, not a victim. Thank you. Thank you, Tando. What I find fascinating across all three of your work, um, not quite the work, the one that you read on Nathan, but particularly with uh, Born on a Tuesday and even on, with, um, a on a Diocrata Street, is the ways in which a coming of age narrative is central to the exploration of what masculinity is. So the, the idea that masculinity is something that you are socialized into, it's something that you learn, there are rituals, there are rights that you need to endure in order to become men. So I'm interested in each of your contexts as you grew up and even as through your writing, how do you know, or how did you come to know what it is to be a man? Who is a man in your society? And I suppose to go to, to use Tando's uh, title, who is not a man and who is a man? We can start with Paul. Um. I guess, you know, I, I can only speak from, well, from my own perspective, first of all, and also, you know, more generally, I suppose, as um, a young um, Black British man. Um, I guess masculinity is dictated by, it's always by your elders, first of all, um, your sort of, your father figures, your, um, your guardians. Um, and whether that's um, other black men, whether that's sort of achieved through um, listening to music or, um, you know, watching football or any other sport, um, you know, sort of pillars of um, society outside of your home. Um, but more often for me, in my case, being, you know, growing up in a very sort of strict um, religious community, it was very much about um, who was um, in between myself and God, in a way. Um, and, you know, those were the elders in my congregation, most of whom were white men. And so if I'm sort of thinking um, as a young man, how am I going to become closer to God? It's to ingratiate myself to white men. Um, and so Jesse um, in Rainbow Milk, um, sort of is in that in that kind of situation where all of the elders in his congregation are white. Um, he he needs to ingratiate himself to them, but also his father at home, or the man who has adopted him, married his mother, is also a white man. Um, and as a queer young man, I guess um, in his in his case, um, the um, his needs are sort of um, maybe confused with his desires. Um, because he doesn't have these role models and because the role models that he does have are telling him certain things about his black masculinity that um, if he perhaps had a black father wouldn't have been the case. Um, such as, for example, um, news of Stephen Lawrence's death being met with, oh, well, he must have done something to piss them off, these white boys, for them to stab him. Um, that's the kind of reaction that he got from his white father. So it's kind of... Um, a difficult and very complex um, situation in terms of um, who you look up to, who you uh, think is the model for you when you when you grow older and become a man yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I think what's quite interesting with both yours and, and our Nathan's work is I think there's an exploration of mal masculinity, particularly within the church or the mosque. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, um, El Nathan, you are from the northern part of Nigeria and the Islamic north of Nigeria. And I'm interested in the ways in which you've explored what it is to be a man in that context. Um, and with Ajaya Kratha Street, then you pivot that a little bit to think through um, manhood or boyhood through Christianity in Lagos. So how do you, what are the differences in those different kinds of religious backgrounds? Mm -hmm. If you will allow me, just before I answer that, 
<clears throat> I really just want to say something to Paul that I think that we have so much more in common than I, re that, than I realized because the novel I'm currently writing is it, it's exactly within that kind of religious community with Jehovah's Witnesses. Unlike Paul, and I just realized that, I was also raised in this community. Um, and it's, it's, it just blew my mind just hearing him say this. And I just wanted to mention that. I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about afterward. I'm writing exactly this now. Wow. And it's, it's just bizarre the, the, how the coincidences, you know, a, 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 a man who is, who's left the community and who is, you know, and that's why I talked about the psychological effects of religion on people and the person them, anyway. We'll there you go, you wait for one Jehovah's Witness novel to come along and two come along. <laughs> it's that classic. Yeah, adage. anyway, um, um, to answer the question, I, I think that in, in especially in Nigerian society, um, one of the things that define masculinity is, is um, general proximity to power. And so one must understand not just the... Um, the way that masculinity relates with society, but the way in which, as a man, one relates with other types of masculinities, and and as defined by one's proximity to power, and power includes financial power, so, you know, social power, cultural power, um, um, and that includes religion and all of that. And so, of course, um, you know. What does what does masculinity mean? For example, in a Muslim religious society, you know, it means the one who is seen as um, um, exemplary in 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 that community. If it's a Muslim community, one that goes to mosque and aspires to, you know, become a leader in that in that religious community. Um, but in Nigeria as a whole, there's one thing that binds a lot of people, which is um, the fact that because we've had such dysfunction for so long. Um, this proximity to power defines everything. And so even, even to, to, to assert one's masculinity means to become successful within this particular context. And failure within this context undermines one's masculinity, however one appears, however one um, um, you know, looks. Uh, if you are able to acquire those means of power, then you are, you know, in quote, a real man. And, and, and you find this across all, all, all uh, different societies, whether in the North or in the South. I mean, it manifests slightly differently because in, in probably the, 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 the core North, you have less sort of overt flaunting of, of um, this power, especially when it's financial power, because of concepts like I describe in this um, essay called Kunya, which is, you know, which discourages uh, immodesty in public, but of course, which does not in any way uh, forbid it in private. Um, and so th these are sort of the pillars of masculinity, so to speak, in, in, in that, I, that I grew up around. But in particular in my house, in my household, for example, like Paul, I grew up around um, um, Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, there was a, a strict... Um, um, adherence to certain rules and people looked up to whether it's the elder in your congregation and you said okay I, as a male you aspire to become an elder you aspire to become a male leader in the congregation and that's that's the height of, of the expression of masculinity especially because it's um, masculinity is very important in this religion because women are not allowed to become uh, I mean they are allowed to become ministers in court but they they cannot uh, perform speaking roles, for example, in the congregation. They cannot uh, pray over the congregation. They cannot lead the congregation in any significant way, except if it's only women in that space. And so as a man, if, once you're 16, you know, 15, if you are baptized, you are able to lead the, the, the congregation and you aspire to someday pray over your mother and your sisters, however much older than you they are you become the leader of that, of that community. And that, this was a, a huge thing. It wasn't so different from other, other, other places, you know, but, but because of how strict this community was, of course, you know, this particular manifestation of masculinity is, 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 could be termed peculiar. Mm -hmm. 
And it's quite interesting, almost the, the ways in which particular rituals then allow you. So once you become baptized, once you've done particular kinds of things, you can now begin to perform as a man, as even if you are, you know, physically a, a young uh, a boy, really. Yeah. And I'm interested then, particularly then Tando, within a man who's not a man. It is, a, again, a coming of age narrative with a young man, a boy, who is going through or has gone through a botched initiation process. And we know every year, particular time of the year in South Africa, we're going to hear the stories of young boys or young men dying to be men, um, quite literally. And so it's been quite interesting for you that you've been very often at the center of controversy in from the very first novel that you wrote in this exploration of, of, um, of this initiation practice. And it's interesting that you're not the first person to have written about it. Um, you know, Nelson Mandela famously in Long Walk to Freedom wrote about his own initiation. Um, not that he went into detail about it, but he did write about it. And because there's so much secrecy around, uh, uh, around going to the mountain with this initiation practice um, takes place, I'm interested in what you think it was that caused such a big furore around your works over the other years that you've, you've been exploring masculinity on the mountain? So the first thing, Panache, is that um, I need to take this platform to say, move over Nelson Mandela. He wrote half a page on the subject. I did the whole novel. So <laughs> I'm the authority on the matter <laughs> in literary terms. Um, I can determine when Nelson Mandela is relevant or not. <laughs> um, so a man who's not a man, you know, this, my part, you know, is uh, dovetails so nicely to El Nathan's, um, where, you know, as a, as a, as a closer boy, when you're born, um, there's only one destination for you. You are a child and there's going to come a time where you need to go through a rite of passage uh, where you transition from being a boy to being a man um, and therefore a responsible member of society. Um, and this is the only way that you can be a man. You, you can only go through this. It has to work. Otherwise, there is no available category for you as a human. You can no longer just be a boy and you cannot be anything else. So it has to work. So when I was writing the story, I was concerned about those boys who do go through uh, the rite of passage in the mountain and something goes wrong and maybe they end up going to the hospital. You know, so I, I wanted to find out what happens to them because they just disappear in society and you never hear their voices about what kind of lives they lead now because they would have been ostracized um, in, the, in, their, in their communities. They, they just don't belong anywhere. They can't even marry anybody because nobody wants to be associated uh, with a failed man. And if you do, you will be ostracized together with them. So it's really, really harsh. Um, perhaps a, a, a side comment is that um, a part of me is really relieved that in this time we're going through this global pandemic in which um, circumcision schools have been banned so they can't take place and for me what what that means is that there's not going to be reports of dozens of young boys dying to be men now in june and, and july and this is probably the first time in in many many decades uh, so there are lives that are also saved by the occasion of uh, this global pandemic um, it was very controversial, obviously, uh, because from the closer culture, this is the only way of, um, of being a man. So I had, you know, the highest authorities of tradition, you know, motivating for the book to be banned. Um, I had any time that I mentioned the book, uh, you know, for example, as soon as we log out of this Zoom, there's going to be some attacks on Twitter. <laughs> And uh, Paul and Nathan are going to be associated with this from this point. <laughs> um, so it's that kind of controversy in the state that we, and the reason for it, Panache, is that the, the, the ritual is held to be something that is sacred, that is not supposed to be spoken about outside of the context of the mountain, and it's not supposed to be spoken about by women. Um, and so me 
taking it and making it a subject of a novel is taboo. Uh, and not only like Nelson Mandela mentioning it in passing in one page, but taking it comprehensively um, and detailing the whole process was uh, seen as a huge betrayal um, of the culture, of, of, of the Kosa culture. And that led to the questioning of my own status as, as a man. And I knew this, um, you know, while I was writing this, and I thought that it was a necessary betrayal, um, you know, of that kind of masculinity, because this is where you go to end your right to be a man um, in this very patriarchal way. And I had questions about that that do not arise in the context of, of the Kosa culture. So it's an ongoing thing, um, it's an ongoing controversy, but that I've never shied away, away from. Um, this book inspired the writing of, uh, of a feature film uh, called The Wound as well, in which we now bring uh, homosexuality as, um, as a canvas um, to the story, but also in the context of traditional male circumcision as well. Um, it's an ongoing controversy, not just men, uh, but you also have, you know, women who are agents of patriarchy who are sitting, you know, at the gate and, um, you know, they, they, they won't take this kind of betrayal of, of their culture. Um, so the story is about a young man who goes through the ritual of traditional male circumcision, things don't go right, and he has to make a decision about whether to stay on the mountain and probably die or lose his penis there or seek uh, medical care and he makes his choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tanjung. Thank you to all three of you. I think what's interesting across all three of, of your bodies of work is the notion of compulsory heterosexuality um, and the ways in which that polices men who are heterosexual, men who might be queer, and how that then also might intersect with um, conceptions or historical conceptions of tradition and religion. So I'm interested in then why that becomes, or why it's so important for us to then police sexuality in particular. Um, and, you know, our Nathan what is quite interesting in that essay that you write is the idea that sometimes, you know, we're making the distinction between men who simply have sex with men. That is not an identity. That is simply just who you choose to sleep with. It's not the same as who you are. Um, so how do these different conceptions around sexuality change in different contexts and not just in different across different contexts i also think about across different historical periods and this is coming from sort of some of the work that a lot of um, african feminist scholars have done to deconstruct the idea that gender is universal sexuality is universal um, the idea that gender is not only sociologically constructed, it's also historically constructed. And I wonder if you might be able to speak through that, through the kind of work that you've done um, with the Dandao um, community in, in Northern Nigeria. And I think. Mm. So within, um, in Northern Nigeria, it's, it's uh, quite interesting how the different masculinities engage with each other. And I say engaged because historically there has been some sort of allowance between the different sort of incarnations of masculinity. And people like uh, um, the, the men I wrote about in, in this piece, Endodu, um, almost voluntarily become a subordinate masculinity for the purpose of hiding in plain sight um, and so what that does is that it allows uh, men who um, exist in this complicated uh, space where marriage is not the result of a, um, a heterosexual romance or or a desire to be with women it's it's a it's a requirement for the purpose of the perpetration of the, the culture and the species, so to speak. And so it really has nothing to do with whether a man likes a woman or not, or whether a man is attracted to a woman. 
a man will get married to a woman because he needs to, you know, give birth to children. And so you find a lot of these men who perform this overt uh, hegemonic masculinity um, ending up um, with endodu who perform certain types of uh, femininity f uh, with these people, with these men who, who go undercover. And it's not, it's not the same as, say, for example, the down low brother concept in, in, as, as is commonly talked about in, among African Americans. It's, it's quite different. It's, it's a negotiation of some sort, I mean, which has become now um, an imposition. But historically, it used to be a negotiation. You know, I provide you this service, you provide me this service. I can perform femininity and you, you give me cover to perform this. And I'm able to perform this, not just with you in private, but also in the community. And so we had Endodu performing ceremonies. We had Endodu um, having marriage parties, in quote. You know, they didn't really call them marriages, but they celebrated the unions between two people. And this happened for decades and decades and decades, of course, before this clamp down on uh, on, on communities like endowed communities by more uh, strict, you know, interpretations of Islam, especially after the 80s, when Saudi money came in and Iranian money came in, and they were both battling for souls in northern Nigeria, and this, of course, led to conservatism rising and 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 people seeking to, of course, um, please the, the people paying for this, people building the mosques. And so the Wahhabis, of course, took hold and, and they became very, very uh, powerful in northern Nigeria. And there was, of course, the Iranian, they were trying to counter the Iranian influence. And what this led to was really conservative uh, uh, interpretations of Islam that completely stamped out any sort of um, uh, performance of, of, of negotiation between masculinities that was anything close to um, 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 sort of, I wouldn't call it a balance, but something close to balance. And now what we have is simply people in power, you know, being able to pay for, for sexual relations with these men and discarding them when, when, when it suits them. And so you find the very men who need this service fighting publicly against any sort of um, manifestation of, of homosexuality in public. Again, there's a, you know, there's, there's, an, there's an explanation to that because I, I mentioned the concept of kunya earlier, which is um, shamefacedness or modesty, which is that among especially Hausa people, it is, it is seen to be uh, um, vulgar to express one's emotions in public, to express one's love, even if it's to one's wife, to um, to flaunt one's wealth, for example. And so it is in this same manner, they object to the, to the, to the, uh, um, the, the, the performance of, of femininity, especially because of pressure from more conservative uh, religious groups. And um, I mean, what has happened now is that everybody has gone undercover. And so that negotiation no longer exists. You know, all we have now are groups that are being hunted down and prevented from even expressing things that were culturally allowed to exist, which is, for example, like these endodu ceremonies. And uh, Rudolf Gaudio explains it so well in his in his text, um, Allah made us, which I made reference to, uh, sexual outlaws in an in an Islamic African city, and how this has changed, especially over the last thirty years. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. I'm interested then if we're thinking historically, but also thinking across generations, Paul, with your book, you're looking at what starts uh, in 1959 um, with Norman, who's in his 30s, he has two children, and he then has to brush up coming from, from Jamaica, coming to the UK, and now brushing up with the racism and new regimes of, of, of um, masculinity within the UK and how he then has to negotiate that and then moving on to, to his, his uh, grandson, um, Jesse. 
how do you or how have you thought about that kind of difference over time? I was really interested in the first section when we were introduced to, to, to Norman and he's interacting with his neighbor who then is sort of chiding or kind of commenting on the fact that Norman is at home while his wife is going to work. And he says, well, there's not really a problem, but it's the white man who's saying that there's a problem with this kind of division of labor. Um, and thinking about how there's different conceptions of gender roles and femininity and masculinity, not just across time, but also across um, spaces that are then sort of visibilized through um, this family dynamic? Uh, yes. Um, I think, you know, in the 1950s, when um, people of the Windrush generation were starting to establish themselves in the UK, um, I mean, things are obviously a lot of people know this story now, but things are extremely difficult in terms of being able to find housing, et cetera, um, and a lot of competition. So, uh, you know, there are rumors occasionally that, um, that um, West Indian men were putting their wives and girlfriends on the street as prostitutes to earn extra money so that they could buy houses, when actually that wasn't the case at all. Um, it was just a lot of hard work that was going on, people doing sort of multiple jobs, um, you know, sharing childcare duties between sort of various couples or living in the cramped house together um, so that work could be done. And, you know, the, there was uh, something, I can't remember the name of it, but there was this uh, sort of monthly sort of everyone putting their sort of money in a pot kind of situation. And, you know, someone would win that money um, at the end of the month and that would sort of go towards a deposit for a house for them. Um, so, but obviously outside of the, um, the West Indian community, uh, people didn't really sort of, um, know that, I guess, uh, what we've learned over the past few years, especially is that, um, you know, when I grew up thinking that, you know, Jamaican people and people from the Caribbean diaspora were here because the British government invited them to be here, that wasn't necessarily the case. The British government opened their doors up to people from New Zealand, Canada, Australia, um, white South Africans in order to come and help the post-war effort. And then sort of realized too late, even when the Windrush, actual Windrush, was um, on its way to its 22nd of June 1948 uh, docking at Southampton. Uh, even during that period, um, you know, frantic memos were being sent around uh, the halls of parliament saying, what have we done? You know, we've got a bunch of black people coming over who are going to, you know, they're basically going to be absorbed into the population. We're going to end up with a bunch of mixed race children. Um, and so it was a sort of, it was a very fraught time, you know, and when normally speaking sort of three years after he um, has moved to the UK, um, as you say, he's got a couple of small children. Um, and this is sort of, you know, the time of the Notting Hill riots, the time of Oswald Mosley and his fascist regime and sort of agenda. Um, you know, the death of Kelso Cochrane um, being stabbed to death in, in London. Um, and so when he's having this conversation with an older white man who's sort of retired, his next door neighbor, you know, Norman by this point is almost completely unsighted. He's, he's lost his vision. And he's sort of been, as you say, chided into um, maybe maybe gaslit as well um, into thinking that you know he's somehow failing in his masculine duties um, because his wife uh, has gone out to do two jobs while he's at home looking after the children. Um, his response is to say, "Well, isn't that the case in in every culture? He's not going to be gaslit into thinking that his." Blackness is the reason for his, you know, perceived shortcomings. Um, and I guess what Norman's going through um, is exactly what Jesse goes through sort of 50 years later in terms of um, being goaded into thinking that his contribution to black masculinity as far as other people or people outside the black male um, gender and race constructs are concerned um, that he somehow is not sort of measuring up to their idea of what a black man is. Um, and so, especially after his disfellowship at the age of 19 and falls under the influence and under the sort of, um, well, I guess he sort of replaces um, his congregation and um, his sort of extended family there with workmates, you know, other teenage boys, um, white boys, Asian boys, who are telling him, you know, you're like, you know, you're not black enough. You, know, you need to do this, you need to do that. 
and so many of the things that they're telling him to do are you know are sort of bad things you know to cheat on women and um be unemployed and lazy and you know smoke more weed you know because that's their idea of what being a black man is um and i guess i mean i had to go through that and i guess a lot of young black men have to go through that before they realize that um black masculinity isn't something that's monolithic it's not and these sort of stereotypes that people sort of put on us are not some, something necessarily to run away from either. Um, but we have to sort of think of ourselves as individuals and take care of our selfhood and educate ourselves. Um, and yeah, um, try to sort of move away from um, the kind of the kind of ignorance that produces the lack of change that um, Norman and Jesse both experience fifty years apart from one another. From one another. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm quite interested then if you know we're coming to the end of our conversation now. But I've been speaking about different masculinities and the hurts within masculinities, and hopefully when we get into the Q and A, we can speak about some of the joys and the tenderness within masculinity as well. Um, but of course, you're not in you know, you don't exist in the world or you don't exist in the world of blackness alone. You also have women in your lives and whether they are your daughters or your sisters or your mothers or not, or your lovers or not, uh, they exist. And it's important that we speak to how black men relate to their wounds and the wounds of black women as well, um, particularly when there are wounds that black men themselves um, might be inflicting while the boot is on their neck as well. So I'm interested, Tando, particularly um, because you then, that was the first thing that you spoke about is how terrifying it is to think about yourself as the father to a black girl. And it no longer can be platitudes, of course, because there's a world that you brought her into. So what does it mean to imagine ourselves and particularly to, uh, to imagine new kinds of black masculinities into existence? What does that practice look like for you on a day-to-day -day as a human being? What does that look like for you as a writer as well? So, I mean, um, I've, I've thought about this, Panache, and um, I kind of have a, a resolution for myself. Um, you know, something that I've been practicing, um, you know, by writing this book that I've spoken about, the film that I've spoken about, and, and things like that. And for me, is um, is realizing what, uh, you know, patriarchy is that it's a system that exists solely for the purpose of um, of, of of power over women um, or, or, and gender non-conforming people. And so, my thing, my approach is um, that because I'm part of that system, I'm a beneficiary of that system, uh, and it's, and it's not even a, a choice. You're you're born and socialized into it. And the power that, I, that is accorded to me by that um, you know, puts me in a position where I can betray that patriarchy. You know, uh, I'll use a concept like social suicide, right? So I know what is at stake uh, for me, you know, be called a man who is not a man, this and this. And that's okay for me because um, I would like to contribute to a world in which my daughter is not potentially going to be uh, a lover to someone who was taught the kind of things that I was taught in the mountain about how to be with a woman. Um, Elnathan mentioned, uh, you know, in this context that um, at 16, as a boy, now you can you can preach to your mother, you can preach, you know, to to even your older sister. The same is true with traditional male circumcision. As soon as you go through that, one of the lessons that you are taught is that there is no woman that is bigger than you now. Um, it doesn't matter if it's your grandmother, your mother, and so on. So, you know, I, 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 I try to live my life and engage in activities that try to, to betray that kind of masculinity because I cannot imagine my daughter having to be with someone um, who will have been taught that. Because it's not every man uh, who's going to be like me and say, this is not right, and, and I'm unsubscribing to it. So the whole thing from my whole project is how to unsubscribe from that kind of masculinity, that way of being as a man, 
uh, and I use my art to do these uh, the activism in, in involved. It's a lot of work. It can't be done by one person. They, there are costs involved uh, because then I have to say to myself, if, if I can't be regarded um, you know, as a man because of this betrayal, then who am I? You know, I have to carve my own way of being a man that I'm comfortable with. Um, and that can hopefully be, you know, the kind of model that, you know, I would want to be associated with my daughter. So in, in a very simple way, it's about betraying that masculinity because I don't want to put the responsibility on women who have to fight patriarchy uh, all the time, but we have to do that um, as well in real and practical ways. And for me, this is one of the ways. Mm -hmm. And now Nathan, you mentioned that, you know, you have the fortune of not having made someone uh, <laughs> pregnant. But um, <laughs> the, the point being that, right, as, as a man who might not be in a particular relation, so you're not going to say, well, I have a daughter and therefore I have to be better for her. But just as a person, as a writer, as your ethical responsibility, what are the ways in which you think that we can respond to the demands that are being made of black men by black women? Uh, and gender non-conforming people, non-binary people, um, what does that look like beyond the, the, the platitudes? What's the silent work, the quiet work that we do beyond uh, the timeline? Hmm. Well, I, well, I do think, um, you know, like all sorts of abuse are like, or all sorts of abuse of power or the acquisition of of the tools with which to abuse power are like you know a cold in the air like 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 an infection you may not be the cause of it but mm -hmm. once you have it it's your duty not to pass it on mm -hmm. um and so that's how i think of it like a like a cold that i that you know whether or not i cause it is, is relevant but that i have and that it, that I can I can pass on to others, even without my consciously trying to do so. And so I even, and this is where I start the the thought of saying, what are the unconscious ways in which I can, you know, um, spread this this disease, um, just by the way that I I have been conditioned to think about myself and my place in the world and and how through just the performance of masculinity in 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 places in which i grew up i very likely will replicate the, the, these abusers and and so that's where i start from before of course the more obvious things of like you know don't rape don't abuse don't hit don't these are easy you know and and that's how i what i I say to myself, what are the ways in which, you know, as an, even as an asymptomatic carrier of, of this kind of virus, I can pass it to others. What are, just in the same way we talk about, uh, you know, Corona, what are your duties when you, 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 you sort of are aware that you've had contact with an infected person? And as men, we've all had contact with an infected person you know, whether or not our fathers were, were present, you know, we were, con you know, raised and conditioned by and around men who themselves received this kind of very faulty um, upbringing. And so, you know, how, how do I not pass it on? And, but then how, you know, how do I tell myself you are infected even though you are asymptomatic? And so just like an asymptomatic person would not praise themselves for not having symptoms, like, oh my goodness, you know, I have Corona, but God, do you see how I don't have symptoms? You know, I also, you know, think, well, there's nothing praiseworthy about not hitting a person or not raping a person, you know, or not doing these things. But what are the ways in which I can still um, um, replicate this kind of behavior, whether in my private life or even passively? And this is the kind of constant interrogation. There is no, um, there is no permanent solution. It's a constant conversation with oneself about the choices one one makes, whether or not one chooses to love black women, 
whether or not one has black women in, 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 in their immediate surrounding. Um, but, but in some way, shape or form, you know, one has either your, your actions or your, or your work has an impact on, 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 on black women. And so it's this constant interrogation of not just intentions, because intentions don't mean anything, but, but on the effects of one's actions. And, and that for me is where it starts. And everything else is a work in progress. And once one knows that, you know, I'm, I'm a virus, you know, laden, asymptomatic person. And that's because even if you've done the work, you, you're still asymptomatic for the carrier. So you say, okay, well, you know, how can I wear a mask if I'm, in, if, if I'm going to enter a supermarket when I'm dealing with other people? You know, in what ways can I stop this spread? Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the conversation I think that must happen in the mind of everyone who's um, been conditioned this way. Thank you. Um, um, I think can, I, can I add something quickly, Panache? Um, <laughs> well, first of all, um, Ilnath and um, COVID-19 has totally stolen your vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the, the small point that I want to add, uh, Banashi, is that, um, you know, when I think about, uh, because men always ask, so what can we do? You know, they go to, to women, they go to gender non-conforming people and say, okay, we, we hear you, but um, we're part of this mess that is patriarchy. What can we do? What can we change? And, and I'm sick of that question. And um, the, the simple uh, solution to this for me is that, Men like us who are here, you know, confidently talking about, you know, the joys of masculinities, the, the, the dangers of masculinities, have to turn around and be the ones that do the work amongst other men. We have that responsibility. It's not going to be the responsibility of those who are, you know, subjects of oppression to, uh, to, to patriarchy. So it's not just going to be... Um, an open-ended thing where you say, oh, wait, what, what can I do? You know, what benefits of patriarchy can I sacrifice today? But no, it has to be conscious work where you turn around and look at other men and say, we have to fix, I have to fix you. I have to make you conscious of your unconsciousness about, um, you know, about your comfort in patriarchy and, and so on. So I want the direction of this thing to be very clear that it's men that, that, are, that should be looking at other men and not just, you know, in an open-ended way saying, um, if I spot patriarchy manifesting itself over there, I might or might not do a thing. That's not how it's, going to, how it's going to work. It's going to be commitment in a clear direction where men are looking at each other and dealing with this. Thank you, Tando. Um, I think what I'm going to do now is going to go into questions. Of course, I have many more questions, such as how do you know you're asymptomatic? Can you be the judge of your own <laughs> asymptomaticness? Yeah. It's a very important uh, thing because there are many men who protest that they're very feminist, but and sometimes those are the most I would say, in my experience, the most scary men because they can speak the language of feminism yeah. and. They understand, you know, how to signal all of those things yeah. and can do that kind of work of gaslighting because they're very adept and they become, they become yeah. even more manipulative. Um, and, you know, so I think that's something that we can speak to. But I'm now interested in just going to the Q&A. Thank you so much to our audience um, who's been with us for the last, I think, uh, about an hour and 15 minutes. So I'm going to open up to, to some questions now. The first one I'll start with is from Mukoma Wangugi, and his question is about black masculinity and um, Black Lives Matter. What's the role of men today in social change in the times you are in vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Black Lives Matter? What would revolutionary men look like? Um, and so what I'm going to do actually is going to take about two questions at a time, and you can feel free to answer or not. Um, and if you have a specific question or person that you'd like to answer, please do put that into to, um, the question box. Um, there is, I'm just trying to go up into the, the chat. Perhaps there's a few people who put in questions earlier, maybe you can put them back in because it's not easy to, to, to find them right now. But the second question I'll get is from um, Shem Hamilton. 
who says, what is the relationship between black masculinity and mental health? How can we overcome the challenges that cause ill mental health in black men? So those are the two questions. Um, let me know who wants to answer um, any of them. Paul, Tando, and Nathan. Sorry, Panasha, could you repeat the first question for me, please? Okay, the first question was from um, Mukoma Wangugi, and his question was, um, oh, okay, sorry, the chat just uh, moved up. He asked about black men and um, black masculinity and Black Lives Matter. What is the role of black men in social change and what is the vision of revolutionary black men? Um, I might answer that question. Um, what is the role of black masculinity in Black Lives Matter? Um, well, at least speak, I think, if I'm not mistaken, speaking to what that looks like, how do those dynamics yeah. play out, and how could it play out in more positive terms, if we put it that way? Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, I first became aware of Black Lives Matter when Trayvon Martin was murdered. Um, and it made me really question, I mean, it was 2012 and, you know, that was when, you know, people were starting to be able to um, film incidents of police brutality against black men and women. Um, people were sort of sharing it sort of much more widely on social media. Um, a lot of blogs, like on Tumblr and Blogger, et cetera, um, written by Black British, African-American, people from the African and Caribbean diasporas sort of delineating um, the process of um, institutional racism. Um, all things that were sort of quite new to me, um, even though I was 30 years old then. Um, and I think that's something that I would want to sort of um, really address for um, young men who are younger than me is to make sure that they have the tools um, necessary to make sure that they have the education um, because we don't get, I think we were talking about this right at the very top, but we don't get, um, especially even, well, in this country, we don't get taught sort of um, about the sort of, the, about imperialism, about, um, the the slave trade, you know, we don't sort of have lessons in school on those things. It's something that you have to sort of take upon yourself when you're older, or, you know, hopefully you've got a parent who will help you out with it. Um, but, you know, I, you know, coming from a Jehovah's Witness family where, you know, the witnesses say, don't worry about anything, you know, you know there's, no, there's no racism in, in the Kingdom Hall. There's no um, sexism in the Kingdom Hall. There's no divorce in the Kingdom Hall. So just, you know, forget about what's out there because that's all going to go. You know, God's going to sort of end all of this. And then, you know, we'll have the whole of the rest of our lives to sort of read about history and the sort of encyclopedias that you're going to be picking out of the rubble, you know, after Armageddon. Um, and <laughs> I mean, it's just completely crazy, but like, it's really dangerous because, you know, I got to the age of 30 when I realized all of these things and started sort of doing the research myself and realized that I was implicated in this, um, what, you know, I always quote bell hooks, like, um, this imperialist, capitalist, white supremacist patriarchy. And there's nothing I can do about that. There's no way of being able to escape from it at all and so you know and because you're taught about you know my history lessons at school were you know coloring henry VIII's wives dresses and you know and that took a long time because there were six of them and like you know but that you know what, why i was why was i not learning about slavery why was i not learning about um black white relations in america um things are slightly different in that respect because um you know, the, the relation between black and white has happened on American soil and it's part of the visual memory. But here in Britain, it's very different. You know, slavery happened overseas. We have no sort of visual memory of anything happening on the British Isles. You know, slave, slavery on the British Isles itself was illegal. Um, you could not keep a slave. And so um, just, you know, just this sort of ignorance really that I 
um, feel guilty of maintaining up until a very late age um, just made me incredibly sort of angry really when I did start to do the research for myself. Um, and so what I would say, um, you know, there's certain things that we're not in control of um, in terms of what uh, police and, uh, you know, how our bodies are treated um, by, um, by others. But what we can do is, as much as possible, arm ourselves with knowledge. Um, you know, what I would love to sort of put in my 12-year-old hands is a stack of books by James Baldwin, Franz Fanon, um, you know, Audre Lorde, bell hooks, you know, people who would show me um, what the world is and, you know, what the world I'm born into is going to treat me like, despite all of the personal individual qualities I might possess. Um, a lot of the work needs to be done by people other than us, I believe. Um, but in terms of uh, the role of black men within Black Lives Matter, I don't think it's our business, really. I don't think it's our, I don't think it's our, um, um, I don't think it's for us to be completely demonstrative about all of this. Um, I think Tando was saying at the top that, um, you know, he's been doing the work for so many years and now he wants to take a back seat. I feel like I've done the same. And I feel, I feel like it's other people's turn to actually sort of do the work um, and educate themselves uh, because there's only so much I can do to, to, to create change. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, I would just, I would think maybe as well, just to add, I think a question around what, what does a revolutionary black man look like? Um, yeah. If you put it this way, I'd I just struggle you. with that question actually because I don't know. Like, what what does I don't know what does a, a black so of course, man, revolutionary so I guess look like? The question is around if we're talking about reimagining, um, yeah. and maybe maybe the question is about what is a, a a black man who's committed to the liberation not only just of himself and other black men but other black peoples around him and other people who've been historically oppressed. What does that man? look like in his practices and in his vision. I think perhaps, Mokoma, you can correct me or not in, in, in that. I think maybe that is what is being asked there. Tanjo, you look like you had a... Yeah, um, I want to take a step. Um, so I'm going to do bullet points <laughs> on this We one. don't have much time. I just want to just add that we, we've only got about 10 minutes. So if you can be quite, okay, you know, I know sure. these are difficult questions, but, you know. So, so for me, the image of a um, revolutionary Black men um, in our time would be, you know, someone who has a radical commitment to non-sexism, non-violence, um, who uh, has a commitment to non-homophobia, non-classist, a person who, whose approach would be intersectional, um, a, a person who would engage on brotherhood that is not based on notions of androcentricism. Um, so, so that's the image, you know, and, and this comes from experience, for example, of Fizz Must Fall and Rose Must Fall, where, you know, basically we had to halt the revolution, <laughs> um, whose revolution this is, if, you know, people who are not men are also subjects of op oppression within those spaces. So the, the changed image of, a you know of a revolutionary uh, black man would be that you know non commitment to non homophobia non violence non sexism um, non classism and be intersectional in in their approach. Thank you, Tando. I think I'm going to move on to the next question, um, and it was I think it was from um, Kumalo. His question was directed at Al Nathan. He says, um, I wonder where the concept as mentioned by, uh, by Almaton of a certain sense of modesty in the public eye comes from. I'm not too familiar with Nigerian history, but it sounds to me like the internationalization or internalization of British manners, which might raise the question of the affective power of history, specifically colonial history. Um, and then we'll move on to the second question from Kumala after yeah. Almaton answer this. Maybe just to, to chip in something, um, about the last question. I'm generally wary of men who use language like revolutionaries, 
the same male performative thing. I'm not interested in being revolutionary. I'm, I'm interested in, in being part of, of a general process. There's, you know, one of the problems we've had is that we've had too many of these revolutionary people, you know, bulldozing their way through processes and trying to, you know, perform um, success in, 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 in their, you know, in their personal progress or, or otherwise. So, so I know I'm not interested in being revolutionary, actually. I'm interested in engaging the responses from what's going on and in, in because even not just the destination, I'm not just interested in, in going to the right destination. I'm interested that I always look at my journey and ask, am I traveling in the right vehicle? And that I'm not always sure that I'm traveling in the right vehicle. You know, I like to make frequent stops and ask, you know, even if I'm traveling in the right vehicle, is the car fit for purpose? Do we need to adjust the air and the tires and all of that? And it, the, all of this takes a whole lot of effort, but also it's a group project. It's not a single person's project. I, I, I don't think that there's any one demographic that has the work to do. And I think that as long as one is like, it's like a seesaw, if one person just stops moving, it, it, will not, it will not move. Everyone needs to respond to the work that others are doing. So even if one person has done the work, other people need to respond to that work. And that's the only way we can move forward together because we cannot excise any part of this world. We cannot cut white people out of, white people out of the world. We cannot cut men out of the world. We cannot cut straight men out of the world. We must, all of the, 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 their actions impact us, whether we're, we're straight or we're, we're, we're queer or whether we're black or whether we're white. And so I think that it's always a group effort and I'm, I'm interested in, in, in always interrogating the journey, the vehicle in which I'm in and whether or not that vehicle is fit for purpose. Now to the question of whether or not that's a British uh, 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 product, I say, no, it is not. And, and this is one of the things I like to, to do when I'm reading history. It's very easy to be carried away by things that were the product of the British. I'm interested in multiple hegemonies. And in fact, there were many before the British. The, you know, if black people are equal to white people, it means that we are also equal of e we're also capable of evil. We're also capable of thinking up such diabolic things in the same way that the British did. And we did it and we, we practiced this, especially in places like Northern Nigeria, in the, in the empire that existed before the British came. We are capable of as much evil, we are also capable of complexity and nuance. And this concept of Kunya is a concept that exists in Hausa before the coming of the British. Remember that in Northern Nigeria, Islam came to the area um, which is now Northern Nigeria as early as the 12th century, you know. And all of the, 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 the uh, factors that led to what is Northern Nigerian culture today have been happening for hundreds of years before any white man set foot in that place. And it's a, it's a combination of religion, of culture, not cultures, you know, of, of, of conquests and the assimilation of other cultures. But even, even before the British came, we had all of these things um, that of course the British either they, they cherry picked and they whatever, whatever. But the, the kind of history I'm interested in is, I mean, in Nigeria is very, I mean, the Brit British were there for only 60 years. I mean, they did a lot of damage in 60 years. But I'm interested in the hegemons that, have, that were there before the British and how, in fact, um, 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 what happened before carried on even though the British left and what they did to, to, to make sure that these things were set in stone as opposed to evolving and becoming something better for example and so yeah no it's so kunya no it's not it's a thing that predates the british um, um it, it exists as a concept of modesty that somewhat can be found in, in in islam but also generally in hausa culture and in cultures around the hausa culture thank you nathan um the next question i'd just like to give it please forgive my pronunciation this should be from uh aslam Bul -Bul um he asked or they ask uh black masculinities are often spoken about in contrast with white masculinities the model man is white was a quote i heard earlier i'm curious about the relationships between brown and black men some of the other nuances between racialized men and how they play out in constructions of masculinity 
Who wants to take a stab at that one? Tandu, I think you, uh, you you seem like you're speaking. No, I was saying that you can also take a step on that one, Banashi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a medium through which the questions are asked. I'm 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 here as your sister. I'm not here to 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 cuddle black men into <laughs> anything. No thoughts on this one. Do you do you not mm. interact with as other men, or are we saying that whiteness is so hegemonic that we are, we are unable to think of or our relations to, and flattens the subjectivity between ourselves and other racialized people? I mean, I would, I would, I mean, my silence is more because um, one of the things I'm I'm trying to engage with more is the way in which I move through the world as a Nigerian, for example, and how I, I don't actually move through the world as a black man, I move through the world as a Nigerian. And, and that brings me into conflict with not just brown or other men, it brings me into, con into conflict with other black men. Mm -hmm. And so in fact, there is no such thing as black men. You know, there is as much um, um, diversity and conflict within even the space people call black men, mm -hmm. as there is between black men and any other, you know, type of men. And so for me, I, you know, I'm, I'm more even these days contemplating the space that I inhabit and how the, the things that I have not grown up experiencing affects how I think of race. And, you know, as you have notoriously pointed out, Panache, we, Nigerians are notoriously um, ill-equipped to deal with matters of race, but Not but, always. but, <laughs> but 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 you know. But I I and, and my traveling through the world as a Nigerian teaches me a lot, actually, and and it helps me see that in fact there are very few groups that you can describe as as monoliths. You know that black men are not all the same that I am as alien to an African-American as I am to an Indian man or a Chinese man, you know, that, that in fact, you know, we must start to, I mean, and so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of ways in which we, we intersect as opposed to ways in which we differ, because that's easier for me to, to, to understand. And then I can think of, think of the other, you know. I, of course I've read, you know, I can regurgitate all of the textbooks that talk about this panache. I can I can just tell you. I've read the books like all of you have, you know, but I'm 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 trying to think of the ways in which I I understand them in my heart, especially as I move through the world. I've only started existing in this sort of space in the past five years, you know. I and before that I was a Nigerian that didn't know any, you know, I knew it, but you know, a Nigerian is a Nigerian. We're all black men, we're the same kind of men. You, you either have money or you don't, it's, that's it. You're either poor or you're not. This is the only thing you needed to, to talk about. But, but once you leave Nigeria, then you realize, oh, they hate us in Ghana. Why? You know, oh my goodness, South African men want to kill Nigerian men. What's the, what's the reason? You think, oh shit, I thought we were all, you know, and then you, you get to African American and you, you think, oh wow, it's even more complicated. And that's why many Nigerians make such embarrassing comments about race, especially when they live in America. Because they land there, they have no concept of race, and they're like, well, you know, whoever likes me. You know, because we are so proud, we don't think that there's anything that affects us as men or as black men to reduce us to, to a race. And so we are ready to play with anyone. And that's why Nigerians are very, you know, we, we, we go through the world very confidently. And so in the end, of course, we would write op-eds and all of that, talking about all these other black people who are, who are not so, you know, and all these brown people who are, you know. So what I try to do now is understand how I move through the world and, and what the struggles of others are. And so my answer to that will be that for me, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting connection to, to first other black people. And then of course, to people of other, you know, demographics. Thank you, Nathan. 
I'd love to continue. Um, this is a really, um, you know, great conversation. I was very reluctant because I thought, you know, black men need to talk amongst black men and I'll listen. <laughs> but I think it's, it's been really um, illuminating and getting to engage with your works and seeing how consistently you've been engaging this question of selfhood and the identity formation over the body of your work has been something that's been quite heartening. And um, just as we close, I would just like to have um, all of you and just closing remarks with a question from Bibi is just to say what or how are we thinking about tenderness and joy and carving that out not just for yourself um, as individuals but in community with other black men as well as in community with other black people and particularly black women if you can just give us sort of your closing thoughts of what you're thinking of um, with regards to that um, as we close off. Um, I think that um, as a diaspora and as black people, um, we really need to look out, look out for each other, look, look after each other, um, you know, we all have different experiences. We're, we're as diverse as any other race um, and you know, there's so much that we can learn from each other. Um, there's so much that we can do together. Um, and it would be nice to think about, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I think it would be nice to think about um, being black, not as, um, as opposed to being white for once, you know, to, to sort of, um, to feel like blackness isn't just being measured against whiteness or that blackness is defined in opposition to whiteness. Um, that blackness can just be what we are and that we can sort of be in that space and sort of discover who we are as black people. Because, you know, in the British, black British diaspora, for example, you know, we're already forgetting the, the stories of um, people who moved here 70 years ago. You know, many of them are dying um, and they're not necessarily leaving much in the way of, you know, anecdotal evidence as to who they are, what they did, um, you know, what their story was, why they moved here from the Caribbean or later on from West Africa and various other parts of the world. Um, and yeah, it would just be nice to sort of find ourselves in a space where we can just sort of have much more or, you know, a much more sort of open discussion about um, masculinity, but not that, it, not black masculinity, just masculinity. Um, and, you know, relations between men and women um, for people of, um, you know, who are non-gender conforming to be, equally represented in the conversation um, and for us all to sort of respect one another. You know, we're in 2020 and the world is really sort of failing at the moment in so many ways. And so, um, you know, we have nothing to lose by just sort of, you know, throwing off um, so many of the sort of stigmas that are attached to homosexuality, to um, to transgender issues, etc., to feminism in some parts, um, and just come together and just have like a much more of a sort of open dialogue, um, one without prejudice, um, where we can sort of define ourselves as black people as opposed to how we've been defined um, in a way that's not our fault. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I would just like to add a small thing to what Paul said, because, you know, he's captured most of what I was going to say in response to BB. But, um, you know, I, I, I imagine, um, you know, black men, you know, being tender, you know, having joy, having fun, and all of this not being based on the oppression of women and gender non-conforming people. That's the key thing. Um, you know, because, you know, when black men or men are having fun, one way or the other, this would have implications, negative implications on women and gender non-conforming people. So the change that I imagine 
um, what need to happen is that you know it must not be based uh, on on those notions. So the, so your tenderness, your joy must not be based on another's oppression. Um, I I think that's the key thing for me. Okay. Um, the ways in which I think of joy and tenderness um, allow me to, they give me permission to do what I call just to standing and staring. And I, I allow myself um, to not judge myself by the standards that, that others might want to judge me, whether within Nigerian society or others. You know, I divest myself of all of those notions of, of success and fulfillment. And I say, I, I grant myself permission to enjoy the dew drops, to enjoy the rain, to dance, to be playful, to act in ways that men, especially men of our age, are not supposed to act. When you've, when you've spotted the odd gray hair, you know, you're supposed to be someone's uncle if you're not someone's father, you know, and then, you know, you shouldn't play like this. You know. But then I know that how one takes care of one's mental health also very impacts on how one deals with others and how one either transmits, um, um, what, how one transmits this virus, like I, I described earlier. And, and just to, to touch on that question, yes, of course, my, my mention of people being asymptomatic is, is talking about the best case scenario. And of course, we know that most people are not there and that one does not, one cannot even judge oneself asymptomatic, just in the same way you don't sit at home and say, I have Corona and I'm asymptomatic. An expert tells you that, a doctor tells you that. Well, you, you, you did have Corona, but you're, or you do have Corona, you, the test is done not by you, but by someone else. And, and all of the sort of metaphors apply. And, and, and yes, I, I allow myself to breathe increasingly and say, you know, it's okay if you do not meet the standards of success that others have set. It's okay, it does not mean that you're lazy. It does not mean that you are failing. Sometimes, you know, especially as a black person in Europe, you know, black people gather and they say, hmm, you know, this is what white people do, mm, these white things. And I say, you know what? I allow myself to enjoy these white things. I allow myself to buy, you know, inline skates at my old age, at 67% of my Nigerian life expectancy and start learning then and fall like an idiot where there are 12 year old white kids skating really well. Because I'm not, I no longer think that I represent black people. That, you know, there's something shameful about a black man splat on the ground and just, you know, where he's not supposed to be. And, and you know, for me, this is just for my, how I, I try to sort of treat myself. So that I know that if I can laugh and I can laugh at myself, then it's not, probably it's not such a big deal if someone else laughs at me. You know, and if I don't take myself that seriously, then I, I probably will be in a better s position to, to interrogate why I feel the way I do when, you know, say, for example, a woman speaks to me a certain way. Or why I feel the way I do when, when a black woman engages with me a certain way. You know, it, what the, where does this come from? I can, I can better do this. And this is just on a personal level, I think. And I'm sure that there's, there's so much more work to be done. But, but thank you for the opportunity to be here. And thank you, Paul. Thank you, Tando. Thank you, Panache. Thank you, Omni. And everyone. Thank you, Tando. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Panache. Oh, thank you so much um, to our, our writers. Um, sometimes people can feel like they're being put on trial. It's not always easy to be, to be honest and reflective um, in front of a, of a big audience, especially when you're, it's digital and everyone can say all they want to say in, in, the, in the chat um, there. So thank you so much for the honesty that, that um, you've brought with this conversation. And I hope that this encourages everybody um, as we go forward, because I think the key thing that we learn here is that this is an ongoing 
ongoing process. There's no single book or text that you're going to buy and we, you know, solved any of the issues. Um, these are centuries long um, problems, but also opportunities and possibilities that we're constantly grappling with and having to imagine through. So thank you so much for your time and being with us. I, I love to be, I was like, I didn't think anyone would pay to be on a Zoom chat, but actually you're here. So thank you so much for supporting this work. And of course, particularly to Kasava Republic and the Black Literary Salon, um, the key thing that we get here and the, the difficulty for me as I was trying to prepare for this is how do I bring in all these very different experiences across the Atlantic and across generations of um, different experiences of, of masculinities? And that's the very point because there's no way in which we can flatten and reduce it to a single way of being Black men, even in envisioning what we'd like, um, different ways of being. It's, it's very difficult to put it down to, to one thing. So thank you for to the panelists for bringing all the complexities in here and thank you to the wonderful questions that we've had. The key thing we take away from here is that we need to commune more so we can learn about our differences and learn more um, as well as, as about our, our um, convergences as well. Um, and I do have one commercial that I have to give very quickly. Um, I was given by Lynette. Let me open my email very quickly. Um, I'm meant to make an announcement. Message from our sponsors because we live in in capsules. I'm kidding. This is just for the next event. Um, the next um, Black Lit Salon is going to be about history. Um, just hold it in a second for me. Uh, can I take off my jacket now? Shit. Yes, you can take off your jacket. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to. Baby said be. we should be pretty, and everyone wore t-shirts. Gosh. Who wore a t-shirt? You, for example. Uh, this is not a t-shirt, this is a clinic. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as hot in Boston as it is in London. <laughs> I'm surprised. Um, sorry, just I'm just getting this um, announcement. So, Paul, we must do this ex Jehovah's Witness meetup. <laughs> absolutely. Like, All right. ex Jehovah's Witnesses unpack black masculinity. Yeah. That, should next, that should be our next Zoom. What tower is going to be watching? <laughs> <laughs> and <the> lighting <laughs> This salon is going to be on Thursday, the 24th of September. It's called Writing Stories, Making Histories. Um, and the uh, uh, blurb for that is Black histories are underexplored and frequently written from a Eurocentric white supremacist perspective. This salon will explore how Black writers, both fiction and nonfiction, engage with the past and challenge the audience to consider their own relationships with history. And if you'd like to keep in touch for information on tickets and lineup announcements, follow at Black, the literary salon. Um, visit the website and sign up to the newsletter or purchase tickets via Eventbrite. Thank you so much to Bibi, Lynette, and the entire team at Cassava and the Black Military Salon. This was absolutely fantastic, and thank you for staying with us for this long. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, everyone. Thank you.